nuclear war. An unimaginably horrific scenario that is so devastating that one could be forgiven for wishing games featuring it had never been made so as not to even hint at normalizing it or psychically willing it into being somehow. Such thinking is deeply unmaterial, of course. Even with dangerous lunatics gaining control of nuclear-armed nations, such a war would be deeply unprofitable to those who currently monopolize political power. Though, the chance for a nuclear exchange to be triggered accidentally remains terrifyingly real as it has nearly happened multiple times before. Nuclear war occupies a strange place in our culture. For prior generations who lived through the Cold War, memories of duck and cover still linger. David Lynch made the nuke the ultimate originator of evil in a Twin Peaks mythos for good reason, painting it as a stain on the very soul of humanity. For games and movies, the aftermath of nuclear war is a common, almost trite setting at this point, yet the act is almost always off-screen, too horrible to be seen directly, unless going for some kind of shock value. Rarely is the idea of conducting the nuclear war itself explored. The reason for this is fairly straightforward, of course, as the consensus of mutually assured destruction rings every bit as true now as it did during the Cold War. Nuclear exchanges between superpowers are definitionally not winnable. The more likely situation of a rogue nation launching a single nuke, or a more limited exchange, are much better narrative fodder in most cases. Yet it is precisely this ultimate civilization-ending clash of superpowers that DEFCON deals in. DEFCON does not ignore this contradiction. The tagline for the game, Everybody Dies, is not an exaggeration. It does, however, flatten the world in interesting ways to achieve balance, and introduces a variety of scoring methods to determine a victor, but more on that later. The presentation of nuclear war in DEFCON similarly does not beat around the bush. With each population center hit, the death toll immediately appears. In truth, the gap between the gamified joy of racking up a ton of points for hitting Sao Paulo or Cairo before anyone else does, and the raw horror implied by the act, might be the widest gulf of its kind in terrestrial gaming. It is a perverse satisfaction, to be sure. And when the nukes land, you feel it. Even without the death tolls, the excellent sound design lets you hear the impact, the terrible low rumble of the explosion the expanding green glow of the radiation. And if you're being nuked, your interface darkens as the grays that make up the continents fade to black as the unrelenting torrents of nukes rain down. If my ears don't deceive me, the music even changes pitch as you lose population, layering yet another element to the nuclear devastation. And the music itself, well, as you've no doubt been hearing, the music is a dirge for humanity. Slow, ambient, yet positively skin-crawling in its potency. It is, in a word, perfect for setting the tone of the game. Occasionally, you will hear a woman's cough mixed in, briefly tying the sound of inflicted human misery to the otherwise somber soundscape. All that said, the discourse I've seen about DEF CON usually starts and ends with what it is. I feel this does the game itself a tremendous disservice. There is so, so much more to be said in the how of how the game works. It is a game that, if played optimally, will make you a complete bastard even among your fellow world-ending players. I would almost go so far as to call DEFCON the Among Us of its day. This is a direct result of the gameplay mechanics as intended, too, not in spite of them. To properly appreciate these emergent properties, please allow me to explain how the game actually works first. Core to the gameplay of DEF CON is managing the nuclear triad. To best explain the triad, let's listen to an expert on it. So the three legs of the triad, though, do you have a priority? Because I want to go to Senator Rubio well, I, after I think, that. And I ask think him. to me, nuclear is just the, the power, the devastation is very important to me. In all seriousness, though, the triad refers to the delivery mechanisms of nuclear weapons such as Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs, submarines capable of launching nuclear missiles, and nuclear-armed bombers. In DEF CON, you utilize the nuclear triad of a given territory. The playable territories are Russia, Europe, Africa, Asia, North America, and South America, all given equal footing. This bears hilariously little resemblance to the real world, of course, in terms of both the internal geopolitical unity of the territories and their nuclear arsenal levels, but hey, can't have a game without it. There are only five commandable unit types in the game, three navy vessels and two kinds of aircraft. In most game modes, everyone gets the same amount of each. 
One would think this would render the combat rather predictable and limit the amount of tactical possibilities, but this actually could not be further from the truth. Most of the units, and the nuclear silos themselves, have alternate operating modes that take a non-trivial amount of time to enter and exit, allowing them to perform other roles. For example, while the bombers are a platform for launching short-range nuclear strikes, carrying one nuke each, they also have a naval combat mode that makes them extremely effective at picking off Navy vessels from a distance. Fighters, meanwhile, only have one mode of operation, that of direct combat, but even they have multiple uses. Their primary role is the interception of enemy bombers, but their speed makes them very adept at scouting enemy territory, critical in finding enemy buildings to destroy with nuclear ordnance. Tragically, fighters have a very limited fuel supply, so many, perhaps most even, never make it back to the relative safety of their air bases and carriers. Fighters also have the distinction of being the only unit that regenerates over the course of the game, adding to their expendability. Now moving on to the naval units, carriers come with both fighters and bombers, but can only launch one type at a time. They also carry four nukes, which bombers who have spent their ordnance can reload with. Carriers also have a dedicated anti-submarine mode, which allows them to destroy submerged enemy submarines, though they cannot launch any aircraft at all while it's active. Now, submarines. Submarines are the most challenging unit to effectively manage, but also the most rewarding. In their passive sonar mode, they can only be detected by enemy submarines in active sonar mode, or the aforementioned carriers in anti-sub mode. They can be useful in direct combat if you keep them safe enough, but they really shine in their role as a fire hose of medium-range nukes, a whopping five per sub. Launching these safely can be tricky, as the sub surfaces in the launch mode, rendering it vulnerable to basically anything that shoots. All it takes is so much as a single lucky bomber in naval attack mode to clear a whole squad of them in short order. Again though, if used properly, they are decisive, particularly against unsuspecting opponents. Finally, battleships. A bit apocryphal to think of them in the context of modern conflict, but here they are what you'd expect them to be. They shred any ship or aircraft that dares to stray too close, but are absolutely clowned on at range by bombers in naval combat mode, or submerged submarines for that matter. Now aside from all these commandable units, there are also buildings that you can place pretty much anywhere you want within your territory. Again, a set amount of each on the standard modes. These installations are hidden unless seen by the enemy. Radar installations, as one might expect, provide a sizable vision range, revealing units and buildings within. They are fragile, however, needing only a single nuke to destroy. Airfields hold a sizable contingent of bombers, as well as a sizable contingent of fighters, which the fighters slowly regenerate. You can only launch one kind of aircraft at a time and takes two nukes to destroy, though being nuked once is enough to destroy a considerable amount of what it contains. Now silos. Silos are inarguably the most critical building in the game by a wide margin, because in their air defense mode, they are literally the only thing that can destroy nukes in flight. Although if you played long enough ago, you might have seen some bugged out fighters trying desperately. This makes silo placement critical to defending your population centers. Of course, in addition to this powerful defense, silos also contain nukes, ten of them each, which can be fired anywhere on the globe, arcing beautifully against the interface. Firing these nukes is a risky maneuver as they reveal the location of the silo, and silos in firing mode cannot shoot down enemy nukes. It is perhaps the most important trade-off to consider in the game, and it takes considerable time to re-enter air defense mode, so launching is not a decision to be taken lightly. It takes three whole nukes to silence a silo, though each hit halves the remaining nukes it contains. Now aside from all this player-deployed stuff, there are also cities, where all the people live. Players do not get to pick where cities are spawned. In most games, the cities are in standardized places, but there are modes where the population distribution is randomized, though all territories always have the same population. Each nuke that hits a city halves its population. Interestingly, if a nuke is shot down near a city, it counts as a glancing blow, knocking a percentage off. In all modes, cities are where games are won or lost. And that's the full catalog of in-game objects. Let's talk about the actual flow of the game now. I'd be remiss if I didn't start with the titular DEFCON mechanic. For those unfamiliar, DEFCON is a portmanteau of defense condition with levels ranging from 1 to 5. Somewhat counterintuitively, the lower the number is, the higher the threat is. 
As a result, in rare cases you might have heard somebody say something like, Things are wild over here, it's DEFCON 5! Not knowing that DEFCON 5 is actually the least dangerous level. Not a mistake anyone who ever played DEFCON would make to be sure. I'd also like to real quickly call out that the exercise term for DEFCON 1 is cocked pistol, which might be simultaneously the most American and horrifying term for imminent nuclear war possible. Anyway, you start the game in DEFCON 5. The focus here is placing your ships and buildings. Nothing can shoot yet, and you can't even deploy fighters. There's no radar vision yet, either. After some time passes, you enter DEFCON 4. Your radar systems engage, and you can start to see enemy units and buildings within radar range. You also have to place any remaining buildings or ships here, or they will be lost. DEFCON 3 is where the fun begins. Your units can begin attacking enemies within range. You can deploy aircraft. A lot of naval battles occur at this stage. DEFCON 2, surprisingly, doesn't actually have any gameplay consequences other than being a reminder to get your stuff in position for DEFCON 1. And finally, you hit DEFCON 1. Nuclear ordnance begins to fly. The game begins in earnest. In strategy game terms, DEFCON is purely a game about micro, which is to say the management of units, rather than the macro, managing an economy and resource collection. There is no production to manage here, only execution, with the big focus here on keeping your units alive and in the correct modes, and timing and concentrating your nuclear strikes so as to waste as few nukes as possible against the air defenses of enemy silos. Critically, there are no ways to mass command groups of units all at once, other than ships that were already placed in formation, which you can change their modes all at once by holding shift. This isn't a mechanic the game actually tells you about that I can recall either. I played a great many games before I learned about it. Needless to say, this makes the game a touch click-intensive. Not that I'm complaining, though, because nearly every click matters. A player that maintains a high actions per minute, or APM, can be devastating. Though there's more to the game than merely clicking quickly, of course. A side effect of all this is that some players will force the game's speed to its lowest setting, real-time, to do all their micro. By comparison, the game is normally played at 5x speed, with higher available speeds being 10x and 20x. Under default settings, the game will always be at the lowest speed requested, though other settings let you put in a speed floor or just fix the speed to a constant rate. This period of real-time micro can be a pretty huge tell, as you can see who is requesting what speed up top. You can generally expect a wave of bombers or sub-launches coming from that player in short order. Or it would be short order if it wasn't so painfully slow in real-time. Even if this gives you significantly more time to react, it can be frustrating if you hadn't planned on spending the entire afternoon in a single game. Amusingly, I recall the community actually came up with a solution for this, where certain dedicated servers would allow you a budget of real-time that each player would be able to use, letting them use it for a limited time without slowing down the game agonizingly. Now, even with all this said, there's yet another twist to the gameplay that I haven't mentioned yet that elevates DEFCON at a very basic level. Every shot has only a percentage-based chance to work. For example, a shot from a silo in air defense mode only has a 25% chance to shoot down a nuke. There's different percent chances for each unit firing and receiving the shot, too. No units have hit points other than battleships and carriers, which require three successful shots each to down. How does this elevate the gameplay, you ask? Well, unlike, say, Company of Heroes 2, where a single missed anti-tank round can have you shouting at your screen, the effect of this aggregated randomness heightens the importance of positioning units to maximize the chances for a kill, while also benefiting the player who can keep large numbers of units well-positioned in attacking the correct targets. As I mentioned earlier, timing is also critical, particularly the timing of one's usage of nukes. In most game modes, you want to move quickly to nuke undefended cities before anybody else does to secure the score. For example, say you are Europe or Russia, you want to be the first to snipe Cairo to give yourself a sizable chunk of free points right off the bat. Any Africa worth their salt knows to place their silos in interior Africa, far away from where they might be seen by radar installations, so it's essentially free, not likely to be defended by silos, only requiring a few nukes at most to secure the points. If you live in LA or San Francisco, you're likely dead in the game for similar reasons too. Nuking a city that has been fairly depopulated gets you next to nothing in terms of points, so you don't want to be late. It is, in literal terms, a nuclear race in most modes. That said, patience is an important virtue here too. 
The ultimate period of vulnerability to look out for is when a player begins launching from their silos. This definitionally means their silos are not in air defense mode anymore, and any shots you make can be pretty guaranteed to land, if you can get close enough with bombers and subs. Most pressingly, this means that you can destroy the silos themselves and both prevent nukes from being launched at you, and leave the target defenseless. One can also destroy the silos in air defense mode, mind you, especially if they are scattered badly, but to do so generally requires a lot of ordnance. Eventually, after all but a fraction of nukes have been detonated or destroyed, the victory timer will start, giving players a final chance to make some moves before the final scores are tabulated. After the victory timer completes, a winner is chosen. Not a team, not first, second, or third place finishes, only ever the one victor, based on their score. This, needless to say, incentivizes a lot of interesting behavior, but more on that in a minute. Now, there are a few different scoring modes a given game can use. The default mode has you get two points for every one million killed, and minus one point for every one million lost. This mode generally leads to a nice balance of offensive and defensive play. Genocide mode, as the charming name might imply, removes the penalty for losing population, granting you a point for every million killed, and no penalty on losses. On the other end, there's Survivor Mode, which scores you purely based on how much of your population you save. As you might expect, the scoring modes can have rather extreme effects on the gameplay. Beyond the score modes, there are also a handful of game modes other than the default and custom settings, though most are not particularly noteworthy. There is, however, one mode that stands out head and shoulders above the rest. Diplomacy. It is in this mode where the emergent properties of DEF CON I alluded to earlier shine through the strongest. It is, by a wide margin, the most interesting game mode if you're playing it with active enough people who get it. It is a mode where the entire world starts as one team, with the survivor scoring mode active. Needless to say, this harmony does not last, and what happens next may or may not surprise you. Around the turn of the millennium, there was an interesting phenomenon in the online multiplayer of the popular strategy game, StarCraft. Because of how the game displayed your win-loss counts whenever you joined a game's lobby, there was a significant social pressure to keep that win counter up, even if one mostly just played the plethora of use map settings custom games, which didn't count. It was still literally a black mark on your record that everyone saw when you joined a game, to have more losses than wins. Fortunately, the community had a solution. For a game to count as a win, it had to be of the melee type, which just meant starting out with the same basics as everyone else. This, however, did not mean that it had to be a fair or even fight. Thus, the 7 vs 1 comp stomp was born. The objective was simple. The 7 players would work together to destroy the single computer opponent in short order, and everyone would receive a nice shiny win for their statistics. That is, unless somebody had deliberately unchecked the Allied Victory tick in the Diplomacy menu. At which point, an entirely different game began. The players were all but locked into the game, not wanting to tarnish their records with another disconnect or loss, but they had no way of knowing short of hacks who had unchecked their Allied Victory box. It became, for all intents and purposes, a game of werewolf. Paranoia ran rampant, Players built up armies to defend themselves while hurling accusations at each other. Coalitions formed and broke as player after player was eliminated, the remaining players trying desperately to eliminate the player or even players who had turned Allied Victory off, so the game could finally end with a win. It was a great way to kill an afternoon back in the day, especially with a friend. But what does this have to do with DEF CON, you might ask? Well, put simply, the kind of emergent betrayal-based gameplay that StarCraft had accidentally created, DEF CON fully embraced as a core gameplay mechanic, especially in the diplomacy game mode. DEF CON expresses this mechanic in a number of different ways. For example, in other multiplayer strategy games, if you can even change your team mid-game, the game makes it very clear to everyone immediately, and your options for doing free damage are limited to forcing your units to attack allied units while you're still allied. 
Defcon, on the other hand, allows you to ostensibly remain allied and go weapons free on an ally with a single uncheck of the ceasefire checkbox. All units will begin to auto-attack that player. If that's too loud and you'd prefer to say, attack a few select units, you can do that too with a little micro. If your opponent fails the metaphorical perception check and doesn't notice your units attacking them, you can devastate their navy. If that's not enough, you can also nuke allied buildings with no penalty whatsoever, so long as those buildings don't lie on cities. The only penalty is occurred if you nuke an allied city. A fun little twist of this is that it encourages players in diplomacy to put structures on cities to discourage such behavior, whereas in the default mode, you would definitely want to keep buildings away from cities so as not to be hit by nukes seeking population centers. In practice, this kind of building destruction betrayal can take a lot of forms, but often comes from bombers passing through an ally's territory. Just passing through, I swear. Then, in a split second, launching from very close range, three nukes to a silo. If they still have you set to ceasefire, their air defenses won't even trigger, as the nukes find their purchase unopposed. Now, let me play a scenario out for you to examine how all this works for, say, a game of diplomacy. Say everybody loads into the game and stays on the same team through DEFCON 3. This isn't always the case, mind you. Some people like to leave the main alliance and form a new one with their neighbors right off the bat, so nobody but their new allies see where they place their stuff. But for the sake of argument, let's say that didn't happen here. Let's say that Africa begins using bombers to snipe at nearby ships from South America. People notice. What, oh what, is the international community to do? Well, that's a question which is gonna have a lot of different answers. Right off the bat, you can go ahead and assume South America started a vote to kick Africa from the Alliance. This vote might not be as bulletproof as you'd think, though. After all, Africa is very much within striking distance of Russia, Europe, and even a big chunk of Asia. Those territories may not want to run the risk of fighting Africa, which would put their populations in danger. Quite the contrary, it's fairly explicitly in their best interest to see South America removed instead, particularly with an Africa bold enough and familiar enough with the game to strike while allied. So they may hop on a vote that kicks South America instead, even if they were the victim of Africa's aggression. Side note here on voting, if there's a vote going to kick you from the Alliance, you don't get a notification. Your notification comes after the vote ends in success and consists of your units changing color and a delightful text blurb at the bottom of the screen. Anyway, South America gets kicked. North America leaves and joins South America. Russia, perhaps a little new, targets North America with their silos, finally seeing a target. Ah, motherland! Asia seizes on the moment and bombs Russia's buildings while still allied. Europe flips out because they were counting on having Russia's silos covering them from behind. Russia isn't sure what happened. Europe is desperately trying to convince Africa and Russia to vote to kick Asia, which Africa doesn't want to do because it would mean a huge naval battle near the Horn, and they're busy with South America. In frustration, Europe leaves the Alliance and uses the subs they had been saving to betray Russia with in the endgame immediately. And so on and so forth. All this is to say that Diplomacy Mode in DEFCON is a game of tricking people into fighting each other while protecting yourself at all costs. For a game where there's really only one map, there are a truly surprising number of ways each game can go down, as players clamor to both protect themselves and knock out the person with the most survivors. Betrayal is a large part of the standard mode games too, I should say. Even more of an incentive to attack a vulnerable territory if you get points for it after all, dropping your alliance before the first nuke hits the city. You really have to go out of your way and specifically change the game settings to force people to not be able to change teams at all. Betrayal is baked into the game to a truly beautiful degree. DEFCON breaks free of the modern dichotomy of crewmates and imposters, letting people play both roles within the same game defending their allies as their allies defend them, then turning on them to secure a victory at the last moment, or even just taking them down with them to spitefully stop them from winning. The mechanical brilliance of the underlying systems gave rise to these amazingly emotional moments between players. These moments were just so raw and real, conniving and cunning, you would not expect such pathos in a game as ostensibly sterile as DEFCON, but I saw it many a time. Unfortunately, there may have been a cost to all the treachery, for while it's brilliant, cool, and good, 
Some may say it wasn't what they were expecting of DEF CON. They came expecting a devastating nuclear war, yes, but being betrayed right before their assumed moan of victory may have proved a lying too far. The simulated nuclear extinction of humanity no match for a wounded ego. Perhaps the game would have had more longevity with fixed teams as a default, or even just including team victories. It's hard to say, 17 years after the fact. No game multiplayer community lasts forever. But I do fear I myself may have soured many people on the game, because I played a lot, and I played to win. Now in literal terms, I'm not exactly sure how much I've played, as the bulk of my time playing the game was prior to March 2009, when Steam began tracking people's time spent in games. I'll note it also wasn't until much, much later that DEF CON added Steam community features tracking your stats, which I always thought was pretty nifty. What I am sure of is I made a lot of memories playing DEF CON, pulling victory from the jaws of defeat with well-placed final strikes, unloading a full stack of subs on unsuspecting targets, and of course, betrayal after betrayal. One time I made a guy so mad when I beat him that he changed his name to mine and then rudely pretended to be me, trying to make everyone still playing the game hate me. Hats off to you, man. It was as simple as typing slash name and then your desired name to escape any meaningful notoriety. Many of the more well-known players did this. Towards the end of the community's activity, there was a pretty good chance that people rocking the default new player name were veterans not wanting to scare anybody away, rather than an actual new player. It really was deception all the way down in DEF CON. And for a game of its relative mechanical simplicity, there were a wealth of secrets that could give you that needed edge over your opponents. There was the basic stuff like correctly grouping your silos and placing them to maximize their coverage of your population while also keeping them hidden, properly cycling your bombers back to carriers and air bases so they could load up on more nukes rather than letting them go to waste, but there were also some pretty arcane strategies like using your nuclear ordnance on enemy or allied ships. Ships in motion could prove a challenge, but if properly employed at a close enough range, you could get guaranteed kills without having to deal with the randomness of projectile combat. Also on the subject of ships, a lot of people never quite realized how fleets moved. The larger the fleet, the easier it is to manage en masse, sure, but the harder it is to maneuver close to land. Smaller fleets had much more options in where they traveled. A skillful player can sneak small groups of subs around the map, moving them to locations where ships in full fleet formation can't go. Spots like these can be ideal launch locations. Moreover, grouping carriers in fleets of two, one in bomber launch mode and one in sub-defense mode, was basically the best defense against submarines you could do, if you could tolerate all the micro. There was also the proper treatment of AI allies. Oftentimes, for whatever reason, people left a game early, although they had an option of reconnecting at any time, leaving an AI player managing their territory. The AI is a very interesting feature in DEF CON, as one might expect. The AI is fairly adept at concentrating its nuclear strikes, though absolutely garbage at fleet management and building placement. It launches from silos at a predictable time, and most importantly, the AI would never betray you leaving them very much so a solved, predictable element of the game to be exploited either for easy kills, a useful ally in air defense, or more commonly, both. AI would never even vote, leaving the optimal path in some diplomacy games to try to force others to leave the Green Donut to use the AI as a shield for as long as possible. All in all, DEF CON was an amazing, if misunderstood, game. Perhaps I shouldn't use the past tense as it is still around, its servers still beeping down in the bunker. Interestingly enough, Introversion even cut a modern ad for it somewhat recently. It's global thermonuclear war. Nobody wins. But maybe you can lose the least. Play online or play alone. Choose your territory, make or break alliances. Arrange your defenses, mobilize your forces, scope out the enemies, select your targets, and strike. But here comes the counter-strikes. Because in this game of mutually assured destruction, everybody dies. Next stop, Armageddon.
I think it's pretty clear though that the game's best years are behind it, barring any sort of meme zoomer invasion. It's a bittersweet feeling, remembering how it was to play a multiplayer game in its prime, knowing it will never be that same way again. The experiences, the moments, gone for all, but memories, like nukes in the rain. And here still, I feel the tinge of regret that I myself may have hastened the game's demise in my teenage years. Perhaps the winning move really would have been to not play at all. Hey there, thanks for watching. Sorry this one took so long, I was forced to move due to the Texas ice storm. More videos are on the way, so be sure to subscribe if you like this one.